According to Joseph Smith, his 1820 vision of deity was preceded by a great revival that agitated him, his family, and his community of Palmyra. In his official history, which he began dictating in 1838, Joseph Smith said, There was, in the place where we lived, an unusual excitement on the subject of religion. It commenced with the Methodists, but soon became general among all the sects in that region of country. Indeed, the whole district of country seemed affected by it, and great multitudes united themselves to the different religious parties, which created no small stir and division amongst the people, priest contending against priest and convert against convert, so that all their good feelings one for another, if they ever had any, were entirely lost in a strife of words and a contest about opinions. I was, at this time, in my fifteenth year. My father's family were proselyted to the Presbyterian faith, and four of them joined that church, namely, my mother, Lucy, my brothers Hiram and Samuel Harrison, and my sister Sophronia. During this time of great excitement, Joseph Smith continued, my mind was called up to serious reflection and great uneasiness. But though my feelings were deep and often poignant, still I kept myself aloof from all these parties, though I attended their several meetings as often as occasion would permit. In process of time, my mind became somewhat partial to the Methodist sect, and I felt some desire to be united with them. But so great were the confusion and strife among the different denominations that it was impossible for a person young as I was, and so unacquainted with men and things, to come to any certain conclusion who was right and who was wrong. At length I came to the conclusion that I must either remain in darkness and confusion, or else I must ask of God. Hi, I'm Dan Vogel. Since 1967, when the Rev. Wesley P. Walters announced that he could find no evidence of a revival in Palmyra in 1820, no aspect of Joseph Smith's first vision has generated more debate. Since that time, apologists have expended a great deal of energy and devised various strategies designed to defend Joseph Smith's 1838 version of his vision. Some have been clever, while others can only be described as desperate. In the following video, I will challenge these apologists and argue that their triumphal declarations about the Reverend Walters are premature. In 1967, the Reverend Wesley P. Walters published the results of his researches into Joseph Smith's claim of an 1820 Palmyra revival, in which he stated, A vision, by its inward personal nature, does not lend itself to historical investigation. A revival is a different matter, especially one such as Joseph Smith describes, in which great multitudes were said to have joined the various churches involved. Such a revival does not pass from the scene without leaving some traces in the records and publications of the period. In this study, we show by the contemporary records that the revival, which Smith claimed occurred in 1820, did not really take place until the fall of 1824. We also show that in 1820 there was no revival in any of the churches in Palmyra and its vicinity. In short, our investigation shows that the statement of Joseph Smith, Jr. cannot be true when he claims that he was stirred by an 1820 revival to make his inquiry in the grove near his home. Two years later, apologist historians at Brigham Young University responded by devoting an entire issue of BYU studies to the subject of the first vision. The main apologetic was presented by Professor Milton V. Backman who exploited an ambiguity in Joseph Smith's account and argued that while Joseph Smith said Palmyra experienced an unusual excitement in 1820, he never said the great multitudes joined the churches in Palmyra. Rather, he argued, a careful reading of the prophet's account indicates that the great increase in membership occurred in the whole district of country, meaning possibly western New York or eastern and western New York and not necessarily Palmyra, Farmington, 
or just the neighborhood where he lived. True, Joseph Smith didn't explicitly say there were great multitudes of converts in Palmyra in 1820, but he didn't exclude Palmyra either, so it is ambiguous. Exactly how Palmyra could take credit for starting a region-wide revival in 1820 while having no significant conversions is not explained. Nevertheless, armed with this narrow and, as I will discuss, incomplete interpretation of Joseph Smith's words, Backman hunted a 50-mile radius for evidence of camp meetings and large conversion rates, and reported, Church records, newspapers, religious journals, and other contemporary sources clearly reveal that Great Awakenings occurred in more than 50 western New York towns or villages during the revival of 1819-1820. Primary sources also specify that great multitudes joined the Methodist, Presbyterian, and Calvinist Baptist societies in the region of country where Joseph Smith lived. Thus, Backman attempted to build his apologetic on an ambiguity in Joseph Smith's description by focusing narrowly on revivalism in the greater Palmyra region and totally ignoring other aspects in Joseph Smith's description, like the revival starting with the Methodists in Palmyra. It's spreading from there to the whole region, and that among the multitudes of converts were Joseph Smith's mother and other family members. Obviously, the converts filing off and then contending against one another were within Joseph Smith's observation, and the fact that those converts included his mother and siblings means that it was in Palmyra, not miles away in some other town. However, Smith made this observation during the revival that occurred in Palmyra in 1824-25, not in 1820. In her history, which she began in 1844, Lucy Smith made it clear that she did not join the Presbyterian Church until after her oldest son Alvin had died, which occurred on the 19th of November, 1823. As she recalled, Shortly after the death of Alvin, a man commenced laboring in the neighborhood to effect a union of the different churches, in order that all might be agreed, and thus worship God with one heart and with one mind. This seemed about right to me, and I felt much inclined to join with them. In fact, most of the family appeared quite disposed to unite with their numbers, but Joseph, from the first, utterly refused even to attend their meetings. To gratify me, my husband attended some two or three meetings, but peremptorily refused going any more, either for my gratification or any other person's. In a redacted passage in the manuscript of her history, Lucy connected the revival to her recovery from Alvin's death, stating, About this time there was a great revival in religion, and the whole neighborhood was very much aroused to the subject. And we, among the rest, flocked to the meeting house to see if there was a word of comfort for us that we might relieve our overcharged feelings. Joseph, Jr. and Sr. had good reason not to attend the Presbyterian meetings with Lucy. Joseph Smith's brother, William, reported that his father didn't like Lucy's minister, the Reverend Benjamin Stockton, because Stockton had preached my brother's funeral sermon and intimated very strongly that he had gone to hell, for Alvin was not a church member. The fundamental flaw in Backman's reasoning was that he did not recognize that Joseph Smith was describing this later well-documented revival in Palmyra, which did include many converts, including Smith family members. In fact, he neglected to address the issue of when Lucy Smith and her children joined the Presbyterian Church and barely mentioned the 1824-25 revival. This was a fatal oversight. Joseph Smith gave more details of the religious excitement in Palmyra that led to the conversions of his mother and siblings when he collaborated with Oliver Cowdery to publish a history of his early life in 1834 and 1835 in the Latter-day Saints, Messenger and Advocate, a Mormon periodical printed in Kirtland, Ohio. In the December 1834 issue, Cowdery described what happened when Smith was in the 15th year of his life or 1820. One Mr. George Lane, a presiding elder of the Methodist Church, visited Palmyra and vicinity. There was a great awakening, or excitement, raised on the subject of religion, and much inquiry for the word of life. 
Large additions were made to the Methodist, Presbyterian, and Baptist churches. Mr. Lane's manner of communication was peculiarly calculated to awaken the intellect of the hearer and arouse the sinner to look about him for safety. Much good instruction was always drawn from his discourses on the scriptures, and in common with others our brother Joseph's mind became awakened. For a length of time the Reformation seemed to move in a harmonious manner, but as the excitement ceased, then strife seemed to take the place of that apparent union and harmony, which had previously characterized the moves and exhortations of the old professors, and a cry, I am right, you are wrong, was introduced in their stead. In this general strife for followers, his mother, one sister, and two of his natural brothers were persuaded to unite with the Presbyterians. This installment of Cowdery's history ended without relating the first vision, and in the next issue he said there was a typographical error in his description of the religious excitement, claiming that it should have read, in the seventeenth year of his life, which would bring the date down to the year 1823. He then gave an account of Joseph Smith's 1823 vision of an angel who revealed the location of the gold plates. Cowdery would not have known that this was still a year too early for the revival he had previously described, obviously with Smith's help. Regardless, it seems that for some reason, Smith had changed his mind about relating the story of his first vision. Nevertheless, Cowdery's account of the revival contains some of the same details Smith would later include in his account of an 1820 revival. Details like the revival beginning with the Methodists, that it was at first harmonious, that a competition for converts caused it to break up into sectarian strife, and that large additions were made to the churches, including the conversions of Lucy Smith and her children to the Presbyterian Church. These elements were also mentioned by Lucy Smith in her account of her conversion. However, the one detail Smith skipped in his later more generalized account was that the revival was touched off by the preaching of Methodist minister George Lane, who hadn't received his appointment over the Ontario New York district, in which Palmyra was located, until July 1824. While the Reverend Walters was unable to find evidence of a revival, or the presence of the Reverend Lane in Palmyra during the early spring of 1820, nor has anyone else for that matter, it was fairly easy for him to demonstrate the leading role Lane played in the 1824-25 revival in Palmyra. This was largely due to the fact that Lane published an account of it in the Methodist magazine. Prior to Lane's arrival, Palmyra's Wayne Sentinel had noted on the 15th of September 1824, a reformation is going on in this town to a great extent. About 25 have recently obtained a hope in the Lord and joined the Methodist Church, and many more are desirous of becoming members. According to Lane's report, written on the 25th of January, 1825, and later published in the Methodist Magazine, I went to Ontario Circuit, where the Lord had already begun a gracious work in Palmyra. In this place, the work commenced in the spring and progressed moderately until the time of the quarterly meeting, which was held on the 25th and 26th of September, 1824. About this time, it appeared to break out afresh. Monday evening, after quarterly meeting, there were four converted, and on the following evening, at a prayer meeting at Dr. Chase's, there were seven. When Lane returned to the Ontario district in the winter, he said, I found that the work which had for some time been going on in Palmyra, had broken out from the village like a mighty flame and was spreading in every direction. When I left the place, December 22nd, there had, in the village of Palmyra and its vicinity, upward of 150 joined the Methodist Society, besides a number that had joined other churches. On the 13th of January, 1825, Lane received news that in the Ontario Circuit, 200 had been added since conference. Lane's account makes it clear that the revival of 1824-25 began in Palmyra with the Methodists, and from there spread like a mighty flame in every direction, which is exactly what Joseph Smith described in his 1838 history, 
for the 1820 revival. More than 10 years after Backman published his apologetic, Marvin S. Hill, at the time a professor of history at BYU, made some important concessions in an essay published in Dialogue, a journal of Mormon thought, in 1982. In the Walters Backman War of Words, it seems to me that Walters has scored some important points, although not nearly as many as he professes. I am inclined to agree that the religious turmoil that Joseph described, which led to some family members joining the Presbyterians, and to much sectarian bitterness, does not fit well into the 1820 context detailed by Backman. For one thing, it does not seem likely that there could have been heavy sectarian strife in 1820, and then a joint revival where all was harmony in 1824. In addition, as Walters notes, Lucy Max Smith said, the revival where she became interested in a particular sect came after Alvin's death, thus almost certainly in early 1824. She said she attended the revival with hope of gaining solace for Alvin's loss. That kind of detail is just the sort that gives validity to Lucy's chronology. I am persuaded that it was 1824 when Lucy joined the Presbyterians. Hill went on to say that Walters has not proved his point about the neighborhood revival beyond doubt, since Joseph never said that multitudes joined in Palmyra itself. So while Hill seemed willing to concede that Joseph Smith anachronistically placed the sectarian strife and Lucy's conversion in an 1820 setting, he still wanted to maintain the possibility that Joseph Smith attended a revival outside Palmyra in 1820, where multitudes were joining the churches. However, this is an unnecessary interpretation, since the revival Joseph Smith described as beginning with the Methodists and spreading from Palmyra to the rest of the region, which we now know happened in 1824-25, satisfies all the elements in his account. When it is recognized that Joseph Smith was describing the 1824-25 revival, it makes little sense to exploit an ambiguity in the same passage to escape an anachronism already conceded. In such case, to argue that Joseph Smith never said there were multitudes of converts in Palmyra is really quite irrelevant. Hill tried to minimize Joseph Smith's anachronistic use of the 1824-25 revival, concluding, if Joseph Smith in 1838 read back into 1820 some details of a revival that occurred in 1824, there is no reason to conclude that he invented his religious experiences. Perhaps not. But whatever may have happened in 1820, the content of such a presumed experience was not what he claimed in 1838. Without the confusion caused by a revival and division in his family as motivation for Joseph Smith's prayer, the question about which church is true would not have been asked of deity, and he therefore would not have been commanded to join none of the churches as he claimed, which is entirely consistent with his 1832 account. In 2006, believing historian D. Michael Quinn published a lengthy defense of Joseph Smith's claim to have experienced a Methodist camp meeting in 1820, while Quinn spent a lot of time trying to bash the Reverend Walters. In the end, he was forced to concede that there were no revivals or camp meetings in Palmyra preceding Joseph Smith's 1820 theophany, which, Smith said, occurred on the morning of a beautiful clear day early in the spring of 1820. Instead, Quinn tried to challenge that dating, arguing that an unusually cold spring that year may have caused Smith to misdate his vision to an earlier time, when it actually occurred following a camp meeting which was held in the vicinity of Palmyra Village on the 25th of June, 1820, as reported in the local newspaper, the Palmyra Register. However, Quinn's argument that the early spring of 1820 was too cold for the motionless activity of a solitary prayer is purely subjective. Quinn based his argument on the research of John C. Lefgren, a Mormon who in 2006 examined weather conditions in western New York in March and April 1820 using the weather diary of a Dr. Walter Wheaton, who lived at Sackett's Harbor, located about 100 miles northeast of Palmyra. 
In an effort to date the first vision, Lefgren wanted to know how many beautiful clear mornings there were in early spring 1820. He found that the optimal days were the 24th, 25th, and 26th of March, when the temperature at 7 a.m. ranged from 44 to 56 degrees Fahrenheit, with four additional days, the 28th of March and 13th, 14th, and 15th of April, when the weather was clear and the temperatures ranged from 40 to 42 degrees Fahrenheit. For the remainder of the month of April, which was outside his arbitrary parameter, morning temperatures went as high as 60, with 10 out of 15 days being above 50 and mostly clear. While Lefgren found these temperatures acceptable, Quinn thought temperatures in the 50s and 60s were too cold, and he emphasized the cold and snowy days in his description. He then concluded, Therefore, because most people connect spring with warmer temperatures above 70 degrees Fahrenheit, it is understandable that, 18 years after the fact, Joseph forgot the late arrival of spring weather to western New York in 1820. Contrary to Quinn's assumption, there was no late arrival of spring in 1820, only normal fluctuations. And even now, the expected temperature in Palmyra, New York, during early spring, is nowhere near 70 degrees Fahrenheit. The average low to high temperature for March is 25 to 42 degrees Fahrenheit. April is 35 to 54 degrees Fahrenheit. And May is 46 to 67 degrees Fahrenheit. In Wheaton's record, the average temperature for March 1820 was 34 degrees, and for April it was 50 degrees, which falls in the range of normal. So the idea that spring of 1820 was unusually cold or delayed is therefore incorrect. Quinn might find it difficult to believe that Joseph Smith would go into the woods to pray in chilly weather, but it seems consistent with the note that Smith added to the manuscript history in December 1842, wherein he said that upon returning home after his vision, he spoke to his mother as I leaned up to the firepiece and told her, Mother, I have learned for myself that Presbyterianism is not true. This image of leaning up to the firepiece is difficult to reconcile with a vision that Quinn thinks followed the 25th of June 1820 camp meeting, which he refers to as late spring, but is actually early summer. According to Wheaton's record, the temperature was 70 degrees in the afternoon on the day of the camp meeting. In the days that followed, the temperatures were between 70 and 80 degrees. With temperatures approaching 80 degrees in late June, it is extremely unlikely that Joseph Smith would have confused it with early spring. Nevertheless, like Hill, Quinn had to concede that Joseph Smith's 1838 narrative contained elements from the 1824-25 revival. However, he argued, I have another perspective about the fact, and it is a fact, that Smith's official narrative about 1820 included circumstances which occurred during Palmyra's revivals of 1824-25. I think Joseph Smith's official history conflated circumstances of Palmyra's solitary Methodist revival in late spring 1820 with the circumstances of Palmyra's extensive revivals of 1824 that resulted in his mother, his sister Sophronia, his brothers Hiram and Samuel, joining the Presbyterian Church. However, since Quinn's attempt at chronological manipulation has failed, and there is no revival to precede Joseph Smith's early spring 1820 vision, there is nothing to conflate the 1824-25 revival with. It is far more likely that Joseph Smith simply inserted the 1824-25 revival into his history where there had been none, because his confusion over which church to join traced itself to his mother's conversion to Presbyterianism and the split in his family over religion that followed Alvin Smith's death in 1823. Thus, Joseph Smith in 1838 used his 1820 vision story to answer a question that came up later in his life. The addition he made in his history in 1842 made that clear. Mother, I have learned for myself that Presbyterianism is not true. This clearly reflects the time when Lucy was pressuring family members to join in 1824. In a lengthy update of previous articles, 
Retired BYU professor Richard Lloyd Anderson tried to argue in 2012 that the revival Joseph Smith described in his 1838 history didn't take place in 1820, but rather in June 1818, suggesting that everyone has been reading the account wrong. Conceding that Walters was correct about there being no revival in Palmyra in 1820, he nevertheless tried to escape this fact by accusing Walters of misrepresenting the 1838 account. Walters arbitrarily isolated 1820, saying that Joseph Smith claims that he was stirred by an 1820 revival to make his inquiry in the grove near his home. However, this incorrectly interprets Joseph Smith's 1838 history and ignores Joseph's 1832 account, which specifically defines the time of his juvenile experiences. According to Anderson, Joseph Smith's 1820 vision was preceded by two years of intense investigation, which is mentioned in the 1832 account, and that the successful Palmyra gathering of 1818 was a contributing cause to the religious confusion that Joseph Smith described in several First Vision accounts. Astonishingly, Anderson insists that this earlier revival is probably the unusual excitement that commenced with the Methodists in and about Palmyra, New York, in the summer of 1818, when Joseph said his serious investigations began. The 1818 revival may have sparked young Joseph's interest in religion, but it's just not the one he described in 1838. Joseph Smith was very clear that the revival he was describing took place in 1820, not in 1818. Joseph Smith said his father moved from Vermont to Palmyra when he was in his tenth year, or when he was nine years old, which would have been 1815, although it was actually 1816. The words, or thereabouts, were added later in a different hand. Then he said, about four years after my father's arrival at Palmyra, he moved with his family into Manchester, which would make it 1819. Then he said, Sometime in the second year after our removal to Manchester, there was in the place where we lived an unusual excitement on the subject of religion, which clearly refers to 1820. After describing this excitement, and it spread into the district and region, Joseph Smith said, I was at this time in my fifteenth year which again is 1820. Anderson's reasoning for moving the revival back two years is not easy to follow, largely because he never clearly explained it. But apparently, he misinterpreted Joseph Smith's statement about the second year as a reference to the second year after the Smith's removal to Palmyra from Vermont, which was sometime in the winter of 1816-17, as Anderson acknowledged in his article. The following vague and incoherent statement is the closest Anderson came to justifying his dating the unusual excitement and revival to 1818. In 1838, Joseph placed his first vision in early spring 1820, preceded by an investigation at length. The peak of his confusion came in his 15th year, which began on his 14th birthday, December 23, 1819. Yet, Joseph placed the Methodist unusual excitement long before that. The references he gave in this statement were verses in Joseph Smith's history as published in the Pearl of Great Price, and verse 5 refers to the unusual excitement in the second year. For him to say that the excitement happened long before Joseph Smith's 15th year, Anderson must have interpreted the second year as a reference to 1818 which, as I have explained, is incorrect. So, as it turns out, Anderson is the one who has misread Joseph Smith's 1838 account, rather than Walters and most of the rest of us. Despite Lucy Smith's associating her conversion to Presbyterianism with the revival of 1824-25, at which time she pressured other family members to join, Anderson has tried to argue that it actually occurred in 1820 because she said that early in her marriage she had received a believer's baptism without commitment to any specific church, and that she maintained this status until my oldest son attained his 22nd year, which was in 1820. Anderson argued that since Lucy dated her change in status to 1820, 
She agrees with Joseph's 1838 history that she made a Presbyterian commitment by early 1820. However, she mentioned neither the Presbyterian church nor her children's conversions, although Anderson assumed such was the case. Anderson also incorrectly asserted that Lucy's history does not mention she joined a church in the surge of religion at Palmyra after Alvin's late 1823 death. On the contrary, she did mention her intention to join the Presbyterian Church, as well as the other members of her family. In her preliminary draft, she said, I tried to persuade my husband to join with them, as I wished to do so myself, and it was the inclination of them all except Joseph. He refused from the first to attend the meetings with us. My husband also declined attending the meetings after the first, but did not object to myself and such of the children as chose going or becoming church members if we wished. Lucy also quotes Joseph saying, It will do you no hurt to join them, but you will not stay with them long, for you are mistaken in them. You do not know the wickedness of their hearts. Whatever happened in 1820 to change her religious status, Lucy still dated her and her children's memberships in the Presbyterian Church to the revival of 1824-25. Given the fact that Anderson is unique in his reading of the early sources and his chronological reconstruction is unprecedented, his many references to Walters and others as revisionist historians strikes me as oddly ironic. Most recently, former BYU professor Stephen C. Harper published a small book in 2012 dealing with Joseph Smith's first vision, in which he also tried to question Walter's research and defend Joseph Smith's 1838 account. Yet he too conceded that Walter succeeded in establishing the fact that Joseph's immediate neighborhood shows no evidence of an 1820 revival, but added that Walter's did so without showing that anything Joseph said was false. Harper could make that assertion only because he uncritically adopted Backman's apologetic about the multitudes being outside Palmyra and because he omitted any discussion of Joseph Smith's claim that his mother and three siblings had joined the Presbyterian Church in 1820, or that the details of the revival that Joseph Smith described matched what the Reverend Lane had reported in 1825. Harper attempts to support Joseph Smith's account of a revival by referring first to the June 1818 camp meeting in Palmyra, the one noted by Anderson, which is irrelevant, then to another camp meeting that was held in nearby Phelps in June 1820, the one noted by Quinn, which is also irrelevant. Next, Harper claims a revival happened in the nearby town of Phelps in the summer of 1819, which relies on unreliable evidence borrowed from Backman. As stated by Harper, about the same time in 1818, Joseph's family purchased a farm in Manchester, about three miles south of Palmyra. The next summer, 1819, Methodists of the Genesee Conference assembled at Vienna, now Phelps, New York, within walking distance of the Smith's new farm. The Reverend George Lane and dozens of other exhorters were present. One participant remembered, the result was a religious cyclone, which swept over the whole region. First of all, the land in Manchester that the Smiths purchased wasn't even legally available until 1820. Next, the participant was Sarepta Marsh Baker, who was about 15 and living in Phelps in 1819. However, her reminiscence was reported without quotation marks by the Reverend Marvin P. Blakesley in his unpublished 1886 Notes for a History of Methodism in Phelps, in which Blakesley combined information from published minutes and memoirs of some of the residents that were more than six decades old. Regardless, nothing is said about Mrs. Baker being a participant at the July 1819 Conference of Ministers, but rather her reminiscence is introduced following Blakesley's discussion of subsequent events in Phelps, which Harper neglected to mention. After referring to the July 1819 Conference of Ministers, Blakesley moved on to name two ministers 
who served in Phelps in 1819 to 20, and two others in 1820 to 21. Information he took from the minutes of the annual conferences of the Methodist Episcopal Church. He then mentioned the reminiscence of Harry Sarsnet about a camp meeting that was held in Phelps where Elijah House preached without giving a year, which Quinn has argued was the June 1820 camp meeting reported in the newspaper as being held in the vicinity of Palmyra. However, House is mentioned in the same minutes as being admitted into the Genesee Conference in 1822. Blakesley then made a summary statement. The year was one flaming spiritual advance. This is followed by Baker's reminiscence. Mrs. Baker says the revival was a religious cyclone which swept over the whole region round about, and the kingdom of darkness was terribly shaken. Finally, Blakesley closes the paragraph by giving the number of converts for the Lion's Circuit for the year, without specifically identifying the year. The membership of the circuit arose from 376 to 650. Blakesley got his numbers from the published minutes for the Lion's Circuit, which included Phelps, which reported that there were 374 members as of July 1820 and 650 members as of July 1821. The year to which Blakesley referred, therefore, is July 1820 to July 1821, which is also true for Mrs. Baker's reminiscence about the extent of the revival, quoted by Harper and erroneously applied to July 1819, although it is more likely that she referred to the 1824-25 revival. Regardless, Baker's reminiscence is irrelevant to Joseph Smith's first vision. Clearly, the impression that Harper gave his readers that there was a revival at Phelps in June 1819, where George Lane was present, which spread throughout the region, is wrong. It was a reconstruction that Harper borrowed from Backman's outdated and flawed 1969 study that was based on a misreading of Blakesley's notes which in turn is not a particularly strong source to begin with. Next, Harper referred to the 25th of June 1820 camp meeting and borrowed Quinn's argument about the unusually cold weather causing Joseph Smith to misdate his vision without mentioning his name or citing his article. Harper's version of this argument, however, is less developed and more misleading than Quinn's discussion. Finally, Harper referred to the contemporary diaries of itinerant Methodist minister Banaja Williams, who belonged to the Genesee Conference, which included Palmyra, as evidence that the Methodists and others were hard at work in Joseph's district all the while. However, from about July 1819 to about July 1820, Williams was assigned to the Ridgeway Circuit of the Genesee District, centered in Orleans County about 71 miles northwest from Palmyra. After about July 1820, Williams was stationed in Moscow, now Leicester, Livingston County, about 56 miles southwest from Palmyra. According to Harper, Williams' journals document much religious excitement in Joseph's district and region of country in 1819 and 1820. They report that Reverend George Lane was indeed in that area in both of those years, and that while there in July 1820, he spoke on God's method in bringing about reformations. Harper evidently believed the Williams Diaries present evidence in support of Backman's thesis, but he also tried to use them to disprove Walter's argument that, except for Elder Lane's brief presence at the July 1819 meeting that appointed him to serve in Pennsylvania, There seems to be no evidence whatever that he even came near the Palmyra area during the 1819-20 period. Of course, Walters was referring to the period from July 1819 to July 1820, the time between annual meetings of the Genesee Conference, which covered Joseph Smith's claim of an early spring 1820 vision. Lane's field of labor was hundreds of miles from Palmyra until July 1824 when he was transferred to the Ontario District, which included the Lion's Circuit that encompassed Palmyra. It has long been known, even by Walters, 
that Lane passed through western New York in July 1820 to attend the annual conference at Lundy's Lane, Niagara, Upper Canada, about 120 miles directly west of Palmyra, but that was too late to be relevant. Nevertheless, Harper makes it appear that the Reverend Lane was frequently in Joseph Smith's area and that on one of those occasions, Lane spoke about reformations, a term Cowdery used to describe one of Lane's revivals, whereas Lane was stationed in Pennsylvania and had visited western New York merely to attend the Genesee Conference in Phelps in June 1819 and near Buffalo in July 1820. On the latter occasion, while traveling a southerly route to Buffalo, Lane stopped to attend a camp meeting at Richmond, Livingston County, located about 30 miles southeast of Palmyra. Williams also attended this meeting, and on the 15th of July, 1820, he recorded that he had found Brother Lane, a presiding elder from Susquehanna District, with five more preachers. The next day was Sunday, and two sermons were delivered, followed by Lane's exhortation. On Monday, 17th of July, Williams accompanied Lane and the other ministers eastward across the Genesee Bridge and on to Niagara, where the conference began on the 20th of July. So much for Walter's being proven wrong. Even fellow apologist Richard Anderson has rejected Harper's evidence from Banaja Williams' journal, because it seems a little too far and definitely too late to be relevant for the first vision early that spring. Quinn has wisely chosen not to defend this old apologetic, preferring to explain the mention of Lane by Joseph and William Smith as the result of anachronistic conflation of memory and narrative. Regardless, it is abundantly clear that placing Lane at the 1820 revival is an anachronism. For decades, Mormon apologists have declared victory over the Reverend Walters, but nothing could be further from the truth. Most recently, Harper, in a somewhat patronizing and triumphal tone, has affirmed, The Walters' thesis, though heartfelt and tenaciously defended by him and uncritically accepted and perpetuated by others, no longer seems tenable or defensible. Thin evidence for revivalism in Joseph's neighborhood or in Palmyra Village in 1820 is not evidence that there was not a vision in the woods near Manchester in the wake of a well-documented religious excitement in that region of country. Sadly, Harper misrepresents Walters' thesis, declaring that Walters erred against the historical method by arguing that a lack of evidence for a Palmyra revival was proof that the vision did not occur. Of course, Walters believed that by uncovering anachronisms, all students of Mormon history will be forced to reconsider the reliability of Joseph Smith's first vision story. That was an unavoidable outcome for all concerned, both Mormon and non-Mormon. But that wasn't his thesis. As quoted previously, Walter set aside the issue of the vision itself to focus on its claimed historical setting, explaining, In this study, we show by the contemporary records that the revival which Smith claimed occurred in 1820 did not really take place until the fall of 1824. That was his thesis, and because Harper never discussed the 1824-25 Palmyra revival or Lucy Smith's conversion to Presbyterianism, he has dealt only with a straw man. Harper went so far as to accuse Walters of committing the fallacy of negative proof, which according to historian David Hackett Fisher, is an attempt to sustain a factual proposition merely by negative evidence. But Walters didn't do that. He also provided positive evidence that the revival that Joseph Smith described occurred in 1824-25, which Harper ignored. The truth of the matter is, the apologists have never adequately responded to Walter's thesis. Backman was so focused on showing that revivals occurred in 1820 outside Palmyra, which only fulfilled a narrow reading of Joseph Smith's description, that he entirely neglected to deal with the issue of Lucy Smith's conversion to Presbyterianism during the revival of 1824-25, which, if he had, would have rendered his evidence meaningless. Marvin S. Hill tried to fill that gap, admitting that the 1838 account was tainted by details from the 1824-25 revival, 
but he nevertheless tried to promote Bachman's apologetic about revivals occurring outside Palmyra in 1820. This was an attempt to preserve the integrity of Joseph Smith's claim that a revival had motivated his prayer and subsequent vision, which conflicted with the claim in the 1832 account that he had concluded that all the churches were apostate. Moreover, such a conflation could not be justified since the 1824-25 revival sufficiently covered Joseph Smith's description, and there wasn't any detail unique to 1820. Nevertheless, Hill could not escape the problem of having young Joseph travel miles from home to observe and participate over an extended period. D. Michael Quinn also acknowledged that Joseph Smith's 1838 account was tainted by the 1824-25 revival, but he tried to argue without good reason that it was conflated with Smith's experience at a camp meeting in nearby Phelps in June 1820. Richard Lloyd Anderson rejected Quinn's arguments about cold weather causing Smith to misdate the revival, and instead moved it back to 1818 based on a fatal misreading of Smith's history. What Backman, Hill, Quinn, Anderson, and Harper have demonstrated is that things become extremely convoluted and murky when Mormon apologists attempt to resist Walter's thesis. If Joseph Smith had dated his vision to the spring of 1825, we would all be talking about how perfectly he described the historical setting of that vision. Instead, we are left with a serious anachronism to explain. I hope you will join me for part three, where I will try to put it all together and explain what I think really happened. I'm Dan Vogel. Thanks for watching.